Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Patricia Warby, my friend and colleague. Hello, Patricia. We're going to have a conversation today. And we thought we'd talk about recovery in a slightly different way than perhaps we have mentioned it in the past. And as anyone who's listened to us will realize, we both work with ME, CFS, fibromyalgia is in helping people to recover and people are recovering fully from those conditions um, with a lot of help, obviously, through uh, the Chrysalis Effect that we both work with through the program. So we talk about recovery and I get got really interested recently in what recovery is really all about in everyday life. So, you know, do we have to have crashed in ME or do we have to have had an accident or an injury in sport to need to recover? You know, do we have to be um, Tour de France riders, you know, who need to recover every night and that that's what makes them be able to win, win a race, basically, the ones who can recover. But what about, I just got me thinking about everyday life, about how we recover from everyday life events, experiences, even small traumas, the things that just happen in our lives every day. And I was thinking about how do we know that we need to recover? You know, what are the, what are the signs and symptoms in our bodies that are saying to us, um, you know, slow down a bit today, you're recovering from yesterday. Can we think about it in advance? So can we actually plan out our week thinking I might need to recover that afternoon? Because a lot of us, certainly I've got to this age of my life without really thinking all that much about it, unless I was absolutely exhausted. And when someone's exhausted, I mean, we'll talk to someone, don't we, who's at work, and they'll say they've had a whole series of meetings, some major thing, perhaps a takeover bid in the company or whatever, and they've been working their socks off and they say, oh, God, I really need a holiday. And people accept that they might well need to recover from this particularly difficult time. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of burrowing under that and saying, what about every day? What mm -hmm. about the fact, we you know, we had to rush to do something today? Well, what do we need to do maybe tomorrow or later today in terms of allowing our system to recover so that we start the next day from that recovered point rather than gathering that debt, which I think, you know, we, we see later on, don't we, particularly with, for example, with CFS, with chronic fatigue, where, you know, you and I have experienced where we, where you crash, where you actually get to the point where you can't get up in the morning. And that's when we realize we need to start looking very seriously about what recovery really means. Mm -hmm. But what about us now? And I was talking to my son, who's just come back from a, a big cycling trip, road cycling trip, and he uses a, a heart rate monitor and he uses a, a um, what do you call it um, power meter and everything so he knows how much power you can put out and what his heart's doing and what his breathing's like and it was interesting because he traveled overnight so he hadn't slept for a whole night and then started on a, a big mountain climb and when he looked at his power meter it was a lower power than he would expect to be able to put out on that climb but his heart rate was high so with that knowledge he was able to say to himself well actually I can't push my power up because my heart rate's showing me that I can't really do that I will blow up you know so he he had to accept however hard it was in his mind because he knows how much power he can normally put out he decided he knew he couldn't do that and he had to use those those reminders if you like um things we don't use on an everyday basis, do we? But it was very interesting to me to think about that, that it was feedback for him that said, yeah, okay, this, this speed, you can do this and you can hold this, but don't push it higher to get that power output higher because your heart rate's gonna, you're gonna really suffer for this. And so we don't have those readings every day for ourselves, but it made me think about, well, what do we have? What readings in a sense do we have? Because we've often mentioned, haven't we, about recognizing the signs in our body, the things our body is telling us and how, generally speaking, I put myself in this category too, we tend to be not very good at hearing the message until the body's starting to shout, until it's actually giving us real pain or it's making us feel too tired or our eyes are, eyes are really sore, we can't see properly anymore. Or, you know, we get those signs and symptoms that have actually, in my mind, the body's shouting. But what about before that, when it's whispering to us? And that's when I realized for my own health, that's what I need to be looking at. And I think for so many people I talk to, if we could help each other to notice those whispered, whispered messages, yeah. you know, what's going on? Because we have a conversation with someone that doesn't go very well and we wish we'd said it differently or it's a bit of an upset. 
that has, as you and I know, and you've written about lots about this in your books, you know, we know that all the things that happen in the body, we only know a tiny fraction probably of what's really going on, but we do have a pretty good idea, don't we, of what's going on hormonally in terms of neurochemicals, etc., in the body as a response to an event like that, which doesn't look very big in the grand scheme of things. But my understanding is growing that actually, if we could accept that we need to give ourselves recovery time and space after an event like that, or after, I don't know if I've ever told you that in kinesiology, when I was first training in health kinesiology many, many years ago, one of the earliest things we learned was tapping around the thymus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, they used to say that actually if you watched awful film of people going over the top from the trenches in the First World War, people would do this. <laughs> Yeah, tapping the thymus to it, it's relieving of stress. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were taught in kinesiology to tap around around about a four-inch circle. So if you trip off the edge of a curb because you've missed the curb, or someone drives out in front of you and you go, <gasps> you know, that's the time to tap around because it de-stresses the system, in other words, recovering straight away. So it doesn't add that little stress into that pile of stresses for that day till we get overwhelmed. It actually goes, okay. <sighs> That one's, yeah, I let that one go. And I love that. I love using that myself and helping my clients to use it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think again, okay, then, so we can do these relieving, relieving things. What, so we need to look at, firstly, what are the signs and symptoms? What's telling us we need to recover? Mm -hmm. What things can we actually do for ourselves? And, you know, what, what effect will that have on our system as well in positive benefit terms? So I don't know. It's a lot. I've thrown a lot in there, Patricia, today. So a lot there. <laughs> any, any ideas to, to come back to me with that? Then? Yeah. So signs and symptoms, I think we lose awareness. You know, mm. you said our, our body screams or shouts at us. Mm. A lot of us are very cut off from our bodies. We're, we're very dissociated from bodies. I work with people like this and I was like that myself up until about 45. Mm. Um, and so we don't actually listen to the signs that are happening, but we are aware of them if we tuned in and things like, um, how do we feel? Are we anxious? Anxiety is a classic sign that we're overdoing it. We're overstressing ourselves. Yeah. Um, a, another one for me um, was uh, actually, it was sort of a, a dizziness feeling um sort of overwhelm in the head you know my brain just couldn't think straight i couldn't find words or i i was trying to explain things and couldn't sort of articulate stuff and i would react i would just be really reactive because i'm not my body is in stress it's not relaxed it's not being able to think uh, computationally um so I'm, I'm coming from my limbic brain from my survival brain and i'm just trying to do whatever I need to do but invariably it doesn't go well <laughs> invariably um, when you're coming from that position you're not really in the flow of life so so there are some physical things as well um, I do believe the body talks to us in many ways and I think there are you know muscle tension my goodness how many people I have worked on who are, I, I myself was like this most of the time okay and when I first went to get some treatment, um, because I had back pain, because I was ignoring everything else, or, you know, I just suddenly was aware because I had pain, which is like the, the screaming. And the therapist said to me, you know, you have a, you've got so much tension in your head and neck. And I was like, have I? <laughs> because, because I don't really know, because this is normal for me. <laughs> so I've, I've got worse and worse over the years. So I think muscle tension and tightness, sudden inexplicable pains like your back goes out the minute you're reaching for the toothbrush or uh, um, um, tingling tension tightness those sorts of things that that seem unrelated to stress really but they are because the brain tells the body through the vagus nerve and through um, cytokines and all sorts of other messengers it kind of regulates it, it's also as it happens a quantum relational field as well that, that vibrates with whatever you're feeling so um, in many many ways the body is the readout of the mind so there are so many ways you can feel it but you may not understand the message at first until you are mm. kind of made aware that the, the mind and body um, are in communication and reading each other now I can't remember the second question what was the second question um, how was how do you become aware 
and how do you be aware <clears throat> what and what can we do i suppose what can we do, can we do? yeah um, I think we really have to pay attention to stress mitigation. And I think you've talked about that because you you sort of said, you know, tapping around the thymus. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lovely one. Uh, rescue remedy. I always take rescue remedy with me yeah. for moments like going to the dentist uh, because it doesn't matter how nice the dentist is and how softly they speak to you and how many choices of different gel you get. You're still yeah. going to be lent backwards in a chair to which you cannot escape and you're going to be sort of held down effectively by the... Yeah. The probing and the lights and it's all very very overwhelming so i always take rescue remedy in my bag with me and i will if if i'm not expecting to have a stress but i have one i come back and i'll always do a little spray in the mouth as well um but you know um using havening um you can do that on the hands you can do it on yeah. the face you know as well as down the arms that's a really good one to to really comfort the system and just say i'm safe and i'm here and it's okay yeah um because when the brain goes into reactivity your stress hormones run absolutely wild through your body and particularly if you have certain uh, genetic tendencies to not metabolize stress hormones things like cortisol adrenaline um, can can stay in the system a lot longer and so you don't decompress very easily um adrenaline in particular is is a hormone that's meant to be burned off so it it's one to propel blood through the muscles and particularly that's why it makes the heart beat really fast it's meant to be preparing you for fight and flight but if there isn't fight and flight if there's boss at work telling you you've got a deadline that you didn't know you had or somebody criticizes you or you're in a relationship that's difficult and tricky and it's an ongoing problem there's no chance to burn it off and so it just sits in your body going around into your organs causing all sorts of mayhem so mm. we do have to find ways to de-stress and recover our sense of equilibrium um, scientifically that's called homeostasis or sometimes allostasis as it recognizes it's not a, a static level it's it's um it's going up and down but within very nice controlled limits ideally if we go outside of those limits that's when we get you know poor digestion heartburn difficulty sleeping insomnia is a classic sign actually i missed that one out insomnia yeah. or difficulties in staying asleep sometimes we can get to sleep but we can't stay asleep because adrenaline is being pumped out um, during the night to keep our blood perfusing through the organs but um, because everything's out of whack and we're we're oversensitized um we 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 don't inhibit that and so we actually wake up as if we need to run and you can often get waves of anxiety as well then so lots of things happen yeah that's a really good point and i think one of the things that occurred to me as you were saying that was that certainly i've noticed for myself over the years that breathing is is hugely beneficial i mean of course it's beneficial it always makes me smile that we, we say, do it so important but actually i you know if, i think if any one of us stops at any time of the day and checks out our breathing the vast vast majority of us will find that we're breathing fairly high in the chest fairly quickly and not deeply and yeah our body is suffering it's actually suffering as a consequence a direct mm. consequence of that isn't it so so even if we simply stop several times and i do suggest, suggest to people and do it myself stop several times a day i mean sometimes back to the idea of the power meter and things that we you know sometimes having having a trigger so every time you put the kettle on or every time you go to the bathroom or you know when you're brushing your teeth you have different times in the day that where you do regular things or even if they're not regular they're still an activity that for you is has some regularity then choose that moment as when you're going to do three deep breaths for example because your body will be so pleased and i think it fits into this idea when we're talking about how we know that we need to give ourselves space for recovery as well because like you said so much of the time where i think certainly for myself I'm not even in connection with it so you know we, we in fact a lot of us we keep ourselves quite busy because we don't like the feeling of sitting down and facing the feelings in our bodies so we tend to push them to one side by saying well i've got this to do and this to do and i won't be able to stop till bedtime or whatever so that if we do stop and say okay in through the nose hold it for a little bit and then 
breath, long, slow breath out. And obviously there are variations. So people call it, you know, four, seven, eight, don't they? Different, different kinds of breathing. I, I help people, I muscle test, which is the best way for the person to do it because I think it's so individual. And I find again, because of these ideas and methods, if someone says you should be able, you should breathe in for fat count of four, then hold it for seven, then breathe out for eight. If by the time you've got to five on holding it, you're gasping, then that's not actually doing you any favors at all. So that I always, when I'm doing it with clients, I'll muscle test because I want to get exactly the right thing for them. And it might change as well over time, it usually will. For myself, I can judge it because I've done it so often. But if I stop and I do that breathing, I can feel the shoulders drop. I can feel the muscles start to relax. I can feel my heart just relaxing a little. And so then we're more likely, aren't we, to think, cool, actually, yeah, it's been a hard morning. Or, yeah, that phone call was quite, whew, took a bit out of me. You know, maybe I just need to sit for a bit with that. Mm. So that even if we do something as simple as taking a few deep breaths, it gives ourselves the chance to sit, stop, listen to, our, to what our body is saying because it stops us just grabbing the kettle and filling the next cup of tea and going off to the next job or back to the computer, which is what we're all tending to do so much, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I'm coming across more and more, for example, I'm sure you see this all the time, people who are really sensitive. We work a lot with sensitive people, as we know, but sensitive to EMF. So, you know, just, just using the computer so much. I, I see now how much we need recovery time. It's not just time off. It's not just time away from, it's actually recovery time because the body mind is finding it really hard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we come off the computer and look at the phone, you know, it's yeah. like this whole system's just going and it's vi like you talk about the vibrational frequencies, which yeah. used to be so fringe. And now we're beginning to understand more and more about what that all means. Mm -hmm. You know, that a thought of, I can't do this, has a vibrational frequency of I can't do this, you know, and our whole body is going to react and respond to that mm. and produce the chemicals that say, yeah, you're right, you can't do this, yeah. and the tension around that. So that mm. you know, there's so much, isn't there, that's linked in with all of this that unless we stop and give ourselves that moment, whether it's tapping the thymus, whether it's taking a deep breath, whether it's a love that one I've been doing lately with people, and oh, the response to this one, it's a lovely one. A guy on called Steve. Oh, his name will come back to me. I beg your pardon. I can't remember his name. Really interesting guy on, on the internet who I've seen who's a, a, an osteopath, I think. And he just suggests you take your shoulders back, your elbows back, and you squeeze your shoulder blades gently together. Mm. And then you make sure you drop the shoulders as you're doing it. And then you squeeze a little bit more. And I get people to do it really sort of steadily. So they start dropping a bit more and then they squeeze a little bit more and they breathe nicely and then they drop a bit more and you're squeezing all the time for about 30 seconds because as he says if you don't hold a, a stretch or a, or a tightening for for more for more than 30 or around 30 seconds you don't actually get the benefit of it so you need to keep holding it and then you say okay drop your shoulders a little bit more just take that down a little bit and make sure you're not sticking your through your chest your chin out because that's something else i tend you know we want to bring the chin back in again mm -hmm. and keep ourselves up nice and straight and then you can feel the back responding to it and i've had people saying like recently oh yeah actually i can feel a difference and then as they keep doing it they oh yeah that's different again and they can feel different parts of their back responding and relaxing and so on and when you finish doing it and you say oh yeah the whole back feels eased yeah. you've released some of that tension and back to what we were saying before, I feel as if we're then giving ourselves a chance to sit for a quiet moment, even for seconds, to listen. Mm -hmm. And how do I feel right now? To tune in, isn't it? Yeah. To tune in yeah. to a part of us that we often just assume is okay, mm. but we never really check yeah. until we, we tune into how it feels. Mm. And I think sometimes yoga do, does that for me. I actually did yoga on Monday and found for about 10 minutes, all I did was focus on my body. Mm. And, and suddenly I, I became aware, my mind actually said, my God, you haven't thought about your problems for 10 minutes. I was yeah. just thinking about my body and I thought, oh, what a gift, because I never used to do that. You know, I used to just, whatever I was doing, I just were around my thoughts and my worries and I would just be building the stress chemical message in my body. Um, I do find going out in nature, you mentioned cycling. Um, I quite like cycling, but I also like walking amongst trees. I find that really, really important for me to 
kind of get away from all the um, electronic signals and, and just to be in negative ions sort of atmosphere, lots of oxygen, of course, if you've got trees there. Uh, very, very key. And, and I was also thinking while you were talking about that, I was thinking about not all stress is obvious and some of it is emotional. It's like our beliefs about ourselves and our lives and they can be the most insidious because they're the ones that sit under your conscious awareness, mm -hmm. directing your behaviors. And another sign and symptom actually comes from that and that's overgiving. Um, overgiving to other people generally. Um, so you'll do everything for other people, but you won't sort of look after yourself. In fact, you will negate yourself as being important enough to have self care or self love. Um, with some of the people I work with, honestly, they, they don't feel worthy of love or care from anyone, let alone themselves. So, so this lack of self worth and um, addiction to, to, busyness and activity and stimulation can also be a classic sign that we are not in our bodies at that moment. We are dissociative and we're existing in a twilight world of our own creation, which is what we call reality. You know, mm. my, my partner doesn't like me. My, my boss is out to get me. Life is difficult. Money is tight. You know, these are beliefs that feel real but they are creations of a thinking brain that has disconnected from your joy has disconnected from your your groundedness as part of a bigger whole i think yeah. um we are in a vacuum right now for meaning <laughs> we have no meaning other than how much can we purchase how many people can like us um you know meaningless things that actually add nothing to the quality and um, sense of self really who we are who we really are so uh, I think we we do yeah. struggle yeah that's really interesting point and it made me remember as you're saying that that sense of you know if we if we just notice for example if I was to say right now I'm just going to go and get something from the other room my mind would be at the door long before I got to the door and you know I often have done this myself and help many people to look at this for themselves because just in noticing that if I get up, I sit on a ball, as you probably can tell, as I'm bouncing. Yes, you bounce, yeah. <laughs> bouncing. But if I get up from the ball, I have to I have to get up in this particular way because the ball's going to move. Mm -hmm. So instead of being straight to the door, where I'm not even in my body at all, I, I'll have to concentrate on putting my feet to a certain place, rolling the ball back, so yeah. I can then slide it back further to then get up. You know what I mean? So Clever, it's helping yeah. me to bring myself into this Space that I'm in which is my body mm. and I've often thought about that and Alexander technique people work with this wonderfully and it's where I got some of my ideas many years ago about you know where we are when we move because so many people you know will actually have injuries from very simple movements as you said earlier on you know you tweak your back I did it in the shower you know if, if I use both hands when I was younger if I use both hands to wash my hair my back would go and I had to learn to keep one hand down and just use one so that my back was somehow stabilized and that was telling me actually there's a lot of tension in my back then because obviously otherwise that wouldn't be an issue and I've only recently learned something new and I, I'm just interested whether or not you've come across this but I'm seeing a chiropractor and one of the things that he, he started to explain, I haven't gone into it in any depth yet with him, but it's that the lower back is linked with the parasympathetic system and the mid back, uh, sorry, upper back is the sympathetic and the neck okay. and the head is parasympathetic again. And I, and I was actually, I'd, I'd rushed to get there typically, of course, you know, here I'm going to a chiropractic session and I had to, the train was late and mm -hmm. I had to do a, a 20 minute walk and make it into a 15 minute walk. And, you know, so I was tight, I was hot and bothered in a sense by the time I got there and of course my upper back which was actually relatively okay before that was now tight and sore and we were talking and he said yeah well that's the sympathetic so that if your your sympathetic is overactive which I know mine is very very mm -hmm. easily then you're going to feel it in that upper back area which is where so many people have those tight muscles it's where the back tends to go really easily isn't it mm -hmm. between the shoulder blades or just above the shoulder blades yeah um, um very interesting. I hadn't come across that idea, but I'm just thinking about it as you've said it. I'm thinking about all the women I know that had frozen shoulder, you know, uh, yeah. such a common and 
a poorly diagnosed syndrome in mainstream medicine. Um, but you think of the stress a lot of those women are under ongoing and suddenly one day they wake up and they can't do this movement anymore, you know? Yeah. So sympathetic fight and flight. I, I'm also interested because of polyvagal theory, and I'm just going to remind our listeners what that is, that the, the nervous system has three hierarchical levels related to um, development, but also sort of evolution as well. So you have your baseline parasympathetic, your, your sort of um, dorsal vagal system, and that's mainly your internal organs. So I guess it would relate to your lower back. Yeah. Um, it's usually below the diaphragm as well. So that again would fit. And then you've got your sympathetic level fight and flight, which is, um, it, it, it runs all the way down the spine, but it's mostly, as you say, the mid back region that it innovates arms, you know, yeah. It's, it's about externalizing fight and flight. Obviously, you want to mobilize your body. Um, and then there's the ventral vagal, which is the top level, which is more about facial recognition, um, mobilizing facial muscles, um, <clears throat> social interaction, of course, putting your head forward, um, smiling, making your eyes crinkle and so on. <clears throat> so it's really um, a later developed system for social connection and it's peculiar to primates, um, doesn't exist in, in other animals. So um, it, it's, you know, phylogenetic, as they say, it sort of develops along lines of need. And as we've become more developed creatures who need kind of interaction with others to feel safe, help seeking is absolutely in the head, neck you know, on this region. So that would be your, you're probably what you're talking about parasympathetic again. It's the, but it's a different yeah. parasympathetic to the one in your lower back mm. would be my guess. Um, yes. So interesting, very interesting. Oh, oh that's fascinating. Well, well, we'll look into that more. I'll certainly find out mm. some more information as well. Yeah, from I'd be interested. Brilliant. Yeah. So I would love to find yeah. out more. I'm talking to All him right. each time I see him. Excellent. Um, so I think we probably will need to stop yeah. there today, but yes. I think what we're reminding people and ourselves it really is some really good breathing many times in the day, especially yeah. if we notice that we are breathing a little bit high in the chest and our voice is going a little bit breathy because we I'm a bit tight. <laughs> so often and it's yeah. like, okay, let's just let's take this down a bit. You know, let's drop the shoulders as you said, you know, let's and maybe try the squeeze and see how that works for you and notice what your neck does when you're doing it. So it's that awareness which we started out by talking about today that just if you do something simple that remind you know, if I find I'm putting my shoulders together I'm like this then it tells me, okay, just let's just see what my body can do with this and mm -hmm. settle into it and enjoy it. And often I help with, to do it with a smile as well, because as we start to smile, obviously we know oxytocin is produced, et cetera, which is the love hormone. It's the helping ourselves to love ourselves as well as, as other people. So all this stuff going on from a simple movement. So that's my challenge to everyone who's watching this today is to do this every day choose something for themselves play there's no great method there's no one thing to do try things for yourself um and experiment and enjoy it so i'm, I'm with you on that the yep. more next time yeah thank you. to talk to you thanks for coming patricia bye pleasure thank you bye